Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor. Today's episode is an amazing interview with an extraordinary person named Charles Goodman, an Ayurvedic practitioner. Charles Goodman has devoted his life to the study and practice of Ayurveda, the world's oldest and most complete system of healthcare. From 1987 to 1992, he studied and worked at the Ayurvedic Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the preeminent center for Ayurveda in the United States. There, he completed a range of academic programs and developed skills in a variety of Ayurvedic treatments. A two-year internship under professor and Ayurvedic physician Dr. Vasant Ladd led to Mr. Goodman's appointment as chief administrative officer and clinical associate at the Institute. In this capacity, Mr. Goodman had overall responsibility for managing the Institute, teaching specialized courses, and attending Dr. Ladd's clients as needed. Mr. Goodman also founded and was the editor of Ayurveda Today, the first journal in the United States devoted exclusively to Ayurvedic medicine. After leaving the Institute in 1992, Mr. Goodman maintained a private practice in the Pacific Northwest working in clinics from Seattle to Portland. A desire to research herbal medicines took him to India in 1994, and during this period, he met Jaivan, the Brazilian therapist who became his wife and partner, also known as Maria Elisa del Silva Costa. Charles and Jaivan worked as a team for more than 20 years to introduce Ayurveda to the people of Brazil. Together they saw thousands of clients, gave lectures and workshops in Ayurvedic medicine, and were frequently featured in newspapers, magazines, and on Brazilian television. In 2015, Mr. Goodman moved back to the Pacific Northwest and is now in private practice on San Juan Island. Currently, Mr. Goodman's houseboat, the Noble Endeavor, is moored in Friday Harbor and serves as his primary office. The good news for everyone listening is that you can also contact Charles Goodman for remote Ayurvedic work. I really think you're going to be intrigued and entertained with today's interview. If you are a new listener or a long-time listener, I urge you to subscribe to this podcast. It really helps me out a lot and send episodes that you enjoy to people you like. I'd surely appreciate it. Charles Goodman, welcome to The Intentional Clinician. We're so glad to have you on the show. Thanks for being available. Thanks for inviting me. So... Yes, I am so excited. We've talked a little bit before uh, this interview, and uh, you have agreed to tell us a bit about Ayurvedic medicine and the philosophy and what you do. And I really think that the guests are going to enjoy hearing about um, the philosophy and the practices and and some of the history from you, as well as what you do to help people um, in your life, what you've done and what you still do. Fire away. All right. So question one is, <laughs> I, we, I would love to just hear a brief overview, talk as long or as short as you want, about what, what is Ayurvedic medicine in general? First of all, Ayurveda is old. And old is always good. Anything that's lasted continuously for 5,000 years, which is considered to be the length of time since Ayurveda was discovered in India, It has to have some utility. Otherwise, somebody would have put a foot through it and that would be the end of it. So uh, its longevity, uh, in a way, attests to its validity. It began under circumstances which might, to a modern scientific mind, seem a little unscientific. Because 5,000 years ago, we didn't have... Uh, research facilities or labs we had no microscopes no we hadn't you know broken the, the the dna codes and so on so how did people discover anything without modern apparatus the answer is in consciousness these um early i suppose they could be considered ayurvedic um, philosophers in deep meditation, discovered through observation and introspection the basic laws of biology. Now, the laws of biology are based on the three conditions necessary to any life form, plants or animals. First of all, 
every living thing requires water. This is why we're looking on Mars and elsewhere, uh, because if there's water on a planet in our solar system, then possibly it can be colonized. If not, it's going to be a problem. So water is one of the, the essential conditions of life. The second uh, condition of life that was observed by these ancient seers was that every living thing must transform material outside of itself into its own tissues. We call this metabolism, and it's almost invariably a hot force, whether using the sun's um, heat uh, for photosynthesis or in the case of, well, for example, human beings or most animals, we use a hot form of chemistry. We produce hydrochloric acid and uh, many other uh, digestive enzymes, bile, and so on. In other words, we cook what we um, choose to be our food in a kind of chemical soup so that we can assimilate it. So water and the fiery process of metabolism are two of the three conditions of life. The third is more abstract. The third is movement. For a thing to be alive, it must have the capacity to move. If it doesn't move, like the famous parrot in the John Cleese business, if it doesn't move, it's not living. All right, so these are the three conditions of life. Water, um, we can say if poetically fire, and movement. Now movement does have an association, even though it's not particularly physical, and that association is air or as the Chinese would have it, wind. Um, you know, the first signs, of, for example, in human beings that we're gonna make it are our first breaths when we come um, into the world. And that process of air going in and out of the lungs is something like a, a pump which drives our circulatory system and oxygenates all the cells in our bodies and so on. So, um, we could shorthand these three requirements by calling them water, fire, and air. These are three of the five traditional elements in most systems of elemental philosophy. Now, these seers, these um, probably enlightened uh, ancient uh, philosophers elaborated from these three biological necessities, an entire system of life and healthcare, because once these um, elements are incorporated into, into, for example, a human body, we can say that they become biological. Water by itself is simply water. When I drink water, it becomes differentiated into mucus and all the wet stuff, um, synovial fluid, tears, you know, the water element in, in uh, blood and so on. And so th through careful observation uh, um, and without Asian, it was uh, discovered how water is used biologically. And this formed um, one third of the philosophy of Ayurveda which can be called tri-dosha. Tri, of course, means three. Dosha means biologic principle. All right, so the first of these three forces, uh, which in Sanskrit language, the first original language is called kapha, a word that means what makes wet. Um, this is one of the three doshas or biological forces that, they, that were discovered 5,000 years ago. The second one, metabolism, uh, the heat element common to all forms um, of operation whereby we assimilate food. Uh, this process of human beings includes a number of uh, chemicals which we manufacture naturally. Uh, and these chemicals, which we would say are hot, they're either acidic or have other uh, heat generating properties, cook the food, even if it's already been cooked, so that we can assimilate it into our systems. Uh, and this hot force uh, is called by the Sanskrit term pitta, 
means what burns. And pitta is one of the three doshas, which um, help to explain how life forms exist uh, on the basis of the food which they ingest necessarily for life. The third force, uh, the third dosha, uh, which has to do with air, or once it's inside our bodies, biological air, has to do with movement in the sense that this force, in addition to giving us the oxygenation uh, necessary to keep us going, um, this force also is responsible for the motor and sensory movement of nerve impulses. In other words, um, everything which moves in a human body, for example, is moved or governed by this force of biologic air. The Sanskrit term for this force is vata. Vata means what moves. So these are the three biologic forces um, which form the basis of Ayurvedic philosophy and ultimately of Ayurvedic medicine. So that's the basis of it. And of course, time passing, um, more and more knowledge was added to this basic structure. And because these rules, these doshas and the way they operate are essential to life, natural to all living systems, uh, we can say that this is the one true natural and biological basis for life itself. So an Ayurvedic physician or practitioner uh, learns to become skillful in assisting, for example, a human body to maintain a balance uh, among these three biological forces. We don't have them in equal proportion some people have a predominance of the water element. Others are predominantly fire in their constitutional type. And then there are, of course, those in whom air predominates. But this is not woo-woo. These are genetically determined by the natural constitutional conditions of the parents at the time of conception. And we are born into the world with a certain proportion or a certain ratio of these three biological forces. And this doesn't change throughout life. It's like fingerprints or well, DNA itself. And in order to be healthy, a person must have the proportion or ratio of these three forces in themselves as they are supposed to be, as they are designed to be by their genetic makeup. So to give an example of how an Ayurvedic physician will um, use this knowledge to help a person with health problems, suppose, for example, a person has an excess of biological water. We could say too much kapha. This can come from a number of reasons, normally through ingesting either too much water or uh, eating uh, foods which themselves uh, have an excess of, of liquid. Too much water in a human body can give rise to excess weight, fat, adipose tissue. And in terms of health, too much water can give rise to congestive problems of health. If a person has too much water, they may well suffer from breathing disorders, asthma, um, well, in worst case cases, COPD. There are all kinds of respiratory problems that are associated with too much fluid, too much mucus in the, in the lungs. Uh, there are also logical and emotional consequences of an excess of biological water. Usually when a person has too much water, there, there's a feeling of heaviness. Um, psychologically, this can feel like uh, being lazy. People with too much water tend to love to sleep 
And this, of course, makes the problem even worse because movement helps the body to get rid of water and inertia allows water to accumulate. So in order to deal with problems of uh, too much biological water, uh, an Ayurvedic physician will recommend um, a diet consisting obviously of drier foods or foods which once ingested cause a dryness in the body to help literally up uh, this excess of fluid, which in some cases can improve uh, respiration, um, result in weight loss, um, and cause much more liveliness emotionally and intellectually. Biological fire, um, pitta, as it is called, if it becomes excessive, there will be too much heat somewhere in the body. It can cause dermatitis, too much heat on the surface of the skin. It can cause digestive disorders, most commonly what people refer to as heartburn or acid reflux. Um, and there are also psychological and emotional uh, implications when a person has too much heat or we could say biological fire. Not surprisingly, this heat can transfer emotionally into irritability, even into anger or jealousy or resentment. These are hot emotions and almost always behind a hot emotion, one can find an excess of biological heat in the body. Again, diet and um, therapeutic herbs can help to rebalance or normalize this condition. And obviously the solution in case of diet will be to remove those foods which cause heat, excess heat. Obviously the um, uh, hot spices will do it. Uh, so too will an excess of salt, which is heating. Um, and the acidic foods um, will also cause excess heat. Coffee, for example, which has a pH of two. Alcohol, which, <laughs> which some of our uh, ancestors and, and uh, early settlers called fire water. So too much heat uh, can cause inflammatory problems anywhere in the body, in any organ or any system. And the solution from an Ayurvedic point of view is to cool the body through cooling foods, cooling behaviors, you know, avoiding the hot noonday sun, saunas, hot tubs, all the rest of it, and uh, replacing these hot uh, aggravating forces with cooling ones. Biological air, um, not surprisingly, is the greatest cause of health problems in human beings because it is so movable. It goes out of balance more easily. Um, and because it governs the nervous system, many of the worst health problems that result from an excess of this biological air include neurological uh, conditions, particularly those which affect us later in life. After menopause in women, andropause in men, um, the hot element of sexual hormones diminishes, stops, and the body literally begins to cool down. And uh, another occurrence that happens in the third age or old age is the tissues start to become dry. And this combination of cold and dry attributes influence the nervous system and can, in susceptible people, give rise to um, Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, and other milder forms of uh, dementia, memory problems in general, uh, and, and all of the rest of that. D digestively, biological air in excess uh, shows up as intestinal gas. Now, most people don't consider gas as a health problem, but it is. If we sustain um, too much gas from eating too much food that 
uh, provokes gas in our intestines. There can be um, digestive problems, including constipation. Um, there can be um, an upward pressure that causes heat um, in the stomach and small intestine to rise up higher in the body and can in some cases even give rise to um, temporal headaches or even migraine headaches. Too much heat higher than it should be pushed up by this pneumatic um, air pressure ex vata uh, can cause many problems um, of all sorts. So that's just an overview, I guess, of the foundation of Ayurveda based on the three necessities of life, water, metabolism or biological fire and movement or biological air and the study and utility of how these three essentials to life operate in a human system and how by ensuring that they stay in their proper place or proper ratio, we can maintain health um, laid into life. Well, I think that is just a great overview, Charles. I feel like I learned just so much right there. It almost feels like you could teach a class on this. Uh, I think you could if you wanted to, obviously. You've been, uh, done. <laughs> you've been at this a while. So um, I think that's great. I Just for the fun for the listeners, we're going to get into some of your story, but I um, just for fun, I wanted to pick on myself for a second, and I've been accused of being vata uh, heavy and... Um, I can't sit still. I like to move around a lot. I uh, do. I uh, do better with grounding. Uh, I uh, grounding materials or warm foods help me kind of relax. I uh, I have a propensity towards eating foods that make me have gas, and that's also something I've been accused of. Um, and so I've already sort of. I've never had in a formal Ayurvedic, um, you know practitioner meeting before but i i have been told just for fun you know after people have observed me that that's exactly what uh, i'm probably leaning towards and i'm i i also not that there's a body type associated but i'm i'm naturally like skin and bones and i have to now that i'm older i can actually gain weight pretty easily but i used to not be able to gain weight at all until about 36 so um just for fun, uh, the listeners, you know, they may identify with this. And I, uh, one of the things I, I uh, also found interesting, well, I found all of it interesting, but one of the things I found interesting was about how this was, um, this is so multi, I mean, we, they, there wasn't multiple disciplines back there, but it's so pervasive, the philosophy and the paradigm that they're looking into nature, seeing how other biological organisms exist. And we're now applying that to the human. And then we're also seeing metaphors and symbols of that throughout uh, nature uh, as our cue. And then, of course, you know they figured out. I'm sure there's lots of properties in the in the things you might take to help balance your uh, constitution. And I, and I like the idea of the constitution because it's very holistic, and it's not so specific. It's taking into account the whole organism versus just saying, "Oh, well, you know." your 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 digestion's off well why is it off and what is the chronic sort of reason it may be off um i don't know that was just me kind of reflecting a little bit about what you what you said uh any comments there before me sure well you've uh you've really uh, nailed an important point um here because if in fact and i suspect you're right if in fact you know vata um, or biological air is higher than it should be in your case, then it's not at all surprising that you would have intestinal gas. And as you correctly uh, understand, that intestinal gas for the most part comes from foods which generate gas. Rem <laughs> I remember as a boy, we were all terribly amused by the, the doggerel poem about Beans, beans, the musical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. Remember that? Beans, <laughs> beans are gas makers. 
um, the brassica vegetables, you know, the cruciform vegetables, and broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and that sort of stuff, cabbage. Um, these are famous gas makers as well. And, you know, once in a while, you know, we all have gas and it's not a problem. But if gas is chronic, it's very, very likely, I would say even probable, that a person will experience some signs of inconvenience, if not poor health, a sign being a mild form of a symptom, which is a more dangerous uh, piece of evidence. Uh, and this, by the way, is, I think, the great utility of Ayurveda, because we can detect before the symptoms of disease arise, we can detect the signs of imbalance in the three biological forces and move through diet and herbs in this country to to correct that imbalance before the problem becomes great enough to require um, more serious medical or even surgical intervention. This in, in, the, in the West, in this country in particular, is the, is the great power of Ayurveda as a, uh, almost as a disease prevention. Now, of course, Ayurveda does have uh, means for um, addressing aspects of more serious illness. But uh, in this country, if a person becomes ill enough to require medical attention, an Ayurvedic practitioner will send to a medical doctor in a treatment. We don't attempt to, to um, practice medicine as such. Ayurveda is not a recognized medical modality yet in this country. So go back to your um, probable excess of biological air. Because this will likely cause the nervous system to operate faster, um, you are, as you say, likely to uh, have some degree of difficulty in focusing your attention on one thing at a time. Um, memory may be a little less than it should be because there's so much information coming um, at the same time through an overactive nervous system. Uh, emotionally, it's very rare, and I know this will sound somewhat revolutionary, but it's very rare. If a person has a set of gas, they will not at the same time feel anxiety. Um, they go hand in glove. And if, if the condition is strong enough, anxiety will increase to fear, which is on the same spectrum. It's just a more aggravated form of anxiety. And in the most extreme cases, that fear can be pumped up to panic disorder or terror. And we live now, uh, without wishing to make political references to, for example, what happened on January 6th. I didn't say that. Uh, we are living in, in, at this time and in this country with a higher background scattering of anxiety because of uncertainty where our future is headed politically, um, in terms of our health with COVID marching through the land. Uh, many people are feeling more anxious than usual. And so uh, Ayurveda can make some very helpful suggestions to you for your individual condition and indeed for the population at large for ways to defend against um, this anxiety, which is so common today, anxiety and indeed fear itself. Food, which is heavier in its nature, will help to ground us and uh, mitigates against excessive air. And this often means uh, the root form of plants rather than the part that grows above ground and particularly the, the, the lighter um, flowery parts of the plant. So any root vegetables, you know, carrots, potatoes, rutabagas, whatever exactly they are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I buy them once in a while on the checkout uh, people never know what they are. They have to ask, you know, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> Turnips. Uh, these are grounding vegetables and they can actually bring more calm because they're heavy, they're um, dense, and they oppose dynamically the light and volatile um, behavior uh, of 
too much air. If a person has a vata disturbance, and you know, you might weigh in from your experience, there can be a certain fragility or even pain, weakness in the low back. Um, there's a very good correlation. Lots of gas, lots of anxiety, low back problems. Why is that? I said before, vata is drying. Um, remember, the Chinese call vata wind. I don't know what the Chinese word for it is, but it's the same concept. Air moving is wind. Wind is drying. Anyone who knows that if you put clothes out to dry on a windy day, they'll dry faster than on a sunny day with no wind. So if we have too much wind, in, in, pr principally in the large intestine, it produces a kind of dryness in the entire pelvic girdle which can result in constipation since the large intestine is, you know, in the, within the pelvic girdle. And it can also cause a certain dryness in the lubricating fluid of the spine, the synovial fluid, which allows the, the vertebra to move against each other without so much friction. And when that starts to get more dry, when the synovial fluid becomes less liquid, then there can be friction and irritation and, spasm and pain uh how's your low back well actually uh, pretty much everything you've described i was sort of identifying with so first of all chronically anxiety is what something i struggled with now yeah. after years of meditation i've been doing meditation since 2005 and yoga and mm -hmm. different exercises it's less of a problem it's more of a flare-up uh, also gas, definitely if I eat beans or, or the cruciferous vegetables, absolutely. It's, it's like a kind of a joke around the house, um, you know, stay away. But the, the hard part is, is that I, uh, my favorite food, uh, genre, if you will, in the United States, we have all these genres of food from around the world is Mexican food uh -huh. and yeah. authentic Mexican food. Um, somehow I developed allergies at about 34, 35 to wheat and dairy. So mm -hmm. can't have the, the queso anymore. Uh, and I have to have corn tortillas, but nonetheless, that's actually quite, uh, so anyway, that is something I'm drawn to. I am drawn to spicy foods and I have had um, chronic lower back issues with the lower spine towards the hips, um, and also neck issues, but that's probably due to lifestyle. Um, I have a very good chiropractor, so that's been alleviated, but I do see all of those symptoms or, or whatever you would call them signals of Ayurveda in my life as a, as a possible Vata yeah. constitution. You know, it's probably better not to go too soon into the deep end of the pool um, by, you know, in, in the initial explanation of Ayurveda, but your reference to the neck pain, uh, this is often a consequence of the gas causing an upward pressure of the hot chemistry of digestion so that almost as if it was a, a fan blowing across a fire. On the other side of the fire, you can feel the heat. Well, it's, an, it's a metaphor, it's an analogy, but something like that happens when we have too much aren't in, in our digestive system, underneath which is this uh, force of air blowing up. And when that heat goes up higher than it should be in our bodies, it is very common to have um, neck pain. That is to say, some tension in the cervical spine or the, trape the, the shoulder blades and trapezius muscles and so on. Um, again, the basic cause of this condition in most cases is an excess of biological air. And if you'll permit me to send you a vata calming diet and a formula of vata calming herbs, you may be surprised to find that your neck pain disappears even as your hip pains and your gas become less and less. And when all that happens, you will wonder where the anxiety went. It, uh, it's amazing how integrated uh, all of our systems are um everything is connected to everything else well and, and that's uh that's true our bodies are looking for homeostasis and it's it's funny we'll we'll jump into the deep end of the pool later but i i remember i was just listening to uh 
how, how there's this big push in the MD community to do integrative medicine and functional medicine. And I'm thinking, what were you doing before? Uh, <laughs> because, you know, they're like, well, I guess we've, we've figured out. And I heard a functional medicine doctor from University of Arizona, Tucson, discuss how, you know, if something was going wrong with the liver, he described this to the interviewer on NPR, you know, the, think of a spider web. You pull on the liver, then other elements are going to be pulled by the spider web. And I thought, I thought this is common knowledge, you know. So I love that Ayurveda starts there. It's it starts finding the constitution. Everything's connected. And uh, as uh, in terms of your invitation, yes, I was absolutely at the end of this going to talk to you about a a consultation, which um, I know we were going to discuss how you help people as well. So I'm interested because. I, I am all about prevention, and I think one of the big things in uh, that I would that I think our country fails on is prevention. And as we've heard, an ounce of prevention is a pound equals a pound of cure. I have no idea who said that, but some sort of, sort of old adage. Uh, but in the United States, we are focused on um, working on the cure and alleviating symptoms and saving people, which is good. We're quite good at that. Uh, but, uh, you know, then they have to keep getting saved over and over and keep getting more things to alleviate the symptoms of that and alleviate the side effects of the medication you're on with this. And, and then before you know it, it's a giant mess. So if we can simplify it with prevention, that, that seems to be what I'm trying to do in my life. And also as a therapist, uh, in the mental health world, a lot of us therapists are saying, good grief, our entire practices are overrun. Uh, we're, uh, you know, people, um, well, especially if you've got a lot of training and you're non-judgmental in your nature, you will start getting more and more and more referrals over and over, and especially if you learn about trauma. So what we're saying is, oh my gosh, what is going on in our culture that um, is definitely not preventive mental health. And so that's another thing where I think Ayurveda, the, the wisdom of it, even if it, we don't apply it ourselves as practitioners, we can say, okay, as mental health practitioners, we need to start getting into the schools and we need to start getting into legislation over um, how to help the public. And we need to start getting into um, workplaces and human resources to help people have better workplaces so that people can start living in a, a manner that is has preventative elements to it. I wouldn't call it treatment, but preventative educational elements so that they can um, not end up in the emergency room and not end up um, taking multiple medications and getting hospitalized or coming to us at a la you know as practitioners as a last hope to save their relationship. So I, I very much align with the philosophy of Ayurveda, even though I'm not trained in it, just the idea of how they, uh, of how the Ayurvedic practitioner will address something. And the whole point, one of the points in modern Ayurveda of what I'm kind of uh, getting from your talk is that um, we want to just prevent you from having to go to the physician to do any more than a checkup and a basic write-up. Uh, you know, we don't want you to have to go for a chronic disease. we We'd love to be able to prevent, you know, this, uh, these diseases uh, from becoming chronic. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's this weird, this is my, this is, tra this is totally my opinion, but here we go. I think there's a strange thing in our culture where people believe diseases just appear out of nowhere and all of a sudden, uh, and there, and then th this is not funny, but this is what I see as the dark humor. My disease appeared overnight out of nowhere. Uh, but luckily the next day I watched four hours of television and I saw seven drug commercials. So I'll just make sure I go to my doctor to cure that disease. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, this in India, uh, Ayurveda is a, a fully um, credited um, medical modality. In fact, it was the only system until the English um, colonized India and made Ayurveda illegal, replacing it with the relatively new modern medicine of the time. And this was a setback there, but now since um, liberation, since Gandhi, uh, Ayurveda has reemerged as the dominant um, modality in India. And Ayurvedic surgeons and Ayurvedic gerontologists and Ayurvedic obstetricians and so on. It's a It's a full... Uh, modern medical modality with uh, toxicology and you know modern imaging and all the rest of it. 
But while it includes what we could almost call heroic medicine necessary for treating serious illness, there is always this component of of disease prevention. Uh, I think personally, of course, I would be um, persuaded in this way, but I think Ayurveda is the true system of health care. And I'm always a little surprised to hear modern medicine referring to itself as a system of health care because pretty clearly it's not. It's a system of disease care. People don't go to a doctor to get healthy. They go to a doctor when they're not healthy. So Ayurveda, actually years ago, I can't remember the date, but I think you can fact check this. Um, The World Health Organization did a review of all of the different modalities of healthcare existing at the time and decided that Ayurveda was the, the modality of choice for developing countries. Oh. Countries where there's not enough money to afford um, heart transplants and other organ transplants and the, the high end of medicine that developed countries can afford. And so uh, many nations which are which have a very poor um, health picture because of lack of money can profit by implementing uh, in, in the educational system, the principles of Ayurveda so that disease can be prevented to the extent that it can. And I liked your observation that um, many people think that the disease happens overnight, that somehow they slept wrong or they caught a bug Um, in fact, the etiology of any illness is usually, um, a fairly lengthy process and, and is, uh, marked, uh, at various stages by clear, um, distinctions. And if you can arrest, uh, problems of developing poor health before they get to a critical stage, um, the world's economy, if nothing else, could be saved because as most most people are understanding, our increasing costs of health care, or if you prefer disease care, will eventually break our economy. The, uh, the, it, it seems continually to increase and increase and increase. The cost of insurance is higher and higher. And uh, too, too great a percentage of our national budgets are devoted to disease care when a much smaller percentage could be devoted to health care and uh, disease and misery could be could be prevented. So um, Ayurveda has a very definite place. Of course, it's the new kid on the block. Most people by now are aware of or have had some experience of Chinese medicine, you know, acupuncture and all the rest of it. Um, Ayurveda probably today is in the same position that that uh, the Chinese medicine was perhaps 40, 50 years ago. And then very few people had heard of it. No one or almost no one had done acupuncture. And now it's common. Um, almost everyone has had a go at Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine uh, is a profound um, and ancient system of medicine, but historically it's the offspring of Ayurveda. Ayurveda began 5,000 years ago and its principles were taken to China maybe a thousand or 2000 years later where it informed um, what even today is modern Chinese medicine. In fact, uh, the principles of Ayurveda were really the principles of healthcare worldwide until maybe the 18th, even into the 19th century when the disease uh, theory and, and, uh, um, um, theories of disease which involved uh, viruses and bacteria and so on became prevalent and the, the principles of Ayurveda were you know, allowed to, to move into the background. But the principles of Ayurveda can never be lost because they're in the nature of things. These three biological forces that I've described are, can be considered the equivalent of the Physics, this gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong weak forces uh, in physics itself. We don't doubt gravity, even though we can't see it. If you step 
too close to the edge, you may have a nasty fall. Um, Ayurveda in its biological way is pretty much the same. We can detect uh, dangers uh, in health and treat them before the dangers become manifest. Wonderful. Uh, great. I am, Are you game for some more questions about you? Sure. Fire away. Okay. Oh, personal stuff. Well, that's a little trickier, but go well, ahead. Okay. Well, I was just curious about, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, um, uh, this is a kind of a two-parter, but how did you get into Ayurveda? And then also, how has it influenced your life uh, path? Uh, as a student at university, I studied philosophy. Um, I, I was, I've always been interested in first causes and why and what for and how it works and so on. And even at that time, I was drawn to Eastern thought. But some time passed before I learned uh, the practice of a meditation technique, um, popular in the 60s and 70s, and still done today, transcendental meditation taught by the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Um, it was a what to do thing in the 70s, Merv Griffin show and so on, popularized it. I was so impressed with the um, the benefits of this practice that I decided to become a teacher of it myself. And so I spent um, quite a bit of time in the next few years with Maharishi in Switzerland and elsewhere in the Alps and to become a teacher of this technique of meditation, which confers many benefits, including some health benefits. But it doesn't take care of all health concerns because it's not designed to do that. It's a mental technique. And while mind and body are connected and improved mental conditions do help health in general, it wasn't enough. And so always in the back of my mind, I wondered what would be the health system equivalent of this meditation that would naturally, non-invasively, and um, universally uh, give us a better health picture. And one day, having come back from my years of living in England, I was in Victoria, the uh, provincial capital of Canada's uh, westernmost province. And I'm sure most people have had an experience like the one I had. I was in a bookstore, and a book seemed almost to jump off the shelf into my hand. I probably didn't do that literally, but that's later what it seemed like. And the book was called Ayurveda. The Science of Self-Healing. The title appealed to me enormously. Self-healing. This is somehow, it struck a resonant chord that if we could somehow learn how to heal ourselves, we could avoid many of the difficulties and expenses of traditional medicine. I'm a slightly impulsive person. I have to confess to that <laughs> in my DNA. I read this book, and in less than one week later, everything I owned was packed up in my truck, and I was on my way to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I was to spend the next five years studying with the author of that book, Dr. Vassant Ladd. I didn't intend five years. I intended to go just for the first year course, but... On the first night of the class, Dr. Ladd asked all the students who intended to spend the rest of their life doing Ayurvedic medicine. And I was surprised that my hand went up. <laughs> and more surprised that no one else's did. Dr. Ladd looked at me and just nodded. And I think he sensed better than I did at the time that this was to prove true. I have spent the rest of my life uh, working in Ayurvedic medicine. But before I began my own practice, I was five years at the Institute. And after my formal studies, I um, did a two-year internship with Dr. Ladd, uh, eventually became the chief executive officer of the Institute. And during that time, I uh, created the first um, um, journal of Ayurvedic medicine called Ayurveda Today, 
which uh, now some 30 years on is still in publication. But all things, uh, you know, change. Nothing stays the same. And at a certain point, Dr. Ladd told me to go and practice Ayurveda, that I would be very successful. This is, <laughs> this is the, the graduation ceremony, the traditional graduation ceremony of Ayurvedic medicine. There are no pieces of paper, no um, final exams to pass through. When your master decides you're ready, he tells you to go and do it. So this is what happened to me. And um, so I began uh, after about five years at the Institute to, to start a private practice here in the Pacific Northwest, live on and, um, and west of Seattle, much closer really to Canada than to the US. And I think here is where I'll end my time on this earth. But before now, I practiced for probably 20 years uh, practicing Ayurveda in Brazil. I was married to a Brazilian woman um, and because she had strong family ties in, in Rio, we lived there together. And during our time working together in Brazil, we saw thousands of patients and gave countless seminars and lectures. And we were, you know, made some presence on the, the print and uh, television media and so on. So I, I think we were partly um, instrumental in bringing uh, the revival virus to uh, Latin America, Brazil chiefly. And then at retirement, we moved back here to the Northwest where even now I'm sitting in my clinic, which is a houseboat uh, loosely tethered to San Juan Island in the uh, San Juan group of islands in the state of Washington. And I will continue to practice Ayurvedic medicine until I can't do anything else. Well, thank you for sharing your, your story. I believe it's, it's very inspiring when somebody um, finds something that they're passionate about um, and sticks to it and becomes an expert because I think young people who listen to this show sometimes wonder, well, I don't feel like I'm good at anything, you know? And I always try to tell young people it's because, well, first of all, you have to find out what you really like doing. And then, then if you've got a passion for it, then it's just a matter of hours and application and, and being open to learning and open to constructive criticism and, and open to finding people to teach you or a school to teach you. And, and, and overcoming those obstacles. And, and you're a living proof of that. And then further, you actually found something that benefits the world. You weren't seeming to be interested in, uh, you know, just finding a nice, you know, I don't know, whatever, American fenced lifestyle with a, with a mansion or a McMansion, as I call them. Um, so it, it, I think it's admirable to, to be doing this to help people uh, find ways to alleviate uh, difficulties, but also uh, prevent future difficulties. And so, I think that's great that you're you're still uh, you've done it, and you're still um, doing it right now. Well, we've all been reminded to follow our bliss. It's usually the the most successful highway. Um, but I can't claim. Uh, thank you for your nice comments, but. Really, my involvement in Ayurveda is, is a question of enlightened self-interest. The enlightened part is, as you generously suggest, you know, helping individuals and indeed helping um, the world today to see the benefits of this natural healthcare system. But it's not entirely altruistic. I, I love doing it. It's a, every client that I see is, is a brand new challenge. It's a, it's almost a blank slate. And I take at least an hour carefully receiving from the client all that's wrong, emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, because each one of these things contributes some pieces to the puzzle of the whole. And so I consider myself something of a, of a health detective. Um, and it's a very charming 
for me to to take the individual problems, let's say, or symptoms, signs, and put them together into a, a whole that's both meaningful and fixable. So um, I look forward to helping you to understand the pieces of your health puzzle and together, because it's something that, remember the what took me to wire in the first place was the science of self-healing. So I'm not gonna heal you, nor really can any doctor do that. You're gonna heal yourself by incorporating uh, principles that are natural to your life and to the life of all living creatures. Well, I'm excited. Um, I I think it's interesting. Uh, I want to just point out some odd synchronicities. So when you said something was, you said something was crashing down earlier, something dropped outside of your houseboat. I heard that yeah. noise. Yeah, and as soon yeah. as you made this proclamation, our computer decided to give us a nice yes. Thanks. So I, I was going to point that out. That might be a little strange, but I these sound effects were uh, not pre-planned, folks. Um, so I want to point that out. But also, I think that is the idea that I think would Im- will, can empower people. And that's what we want to do in mental health. And I think that's what Ayurveda does is it's about you can detect, you're, you're a detective and, and we're a guide, you know, the mental health practitioner should be a guide, a little bit of a detective, but mostly a guide and, and, and Ayurveda is investigating. And then who does the work, but the person who has come to make the appointment, I can only do so much work in the mental health office before, and I can really do some good interventions and some great things that can help you in that moment with the experience. But then you have to take our work together and go do that in your life. And you have to start these epiphanies you have in the office. You must, you must imp- start implementing them. And you, and, and the goals we set together, um, I'm only one hour of your life or one hour of your month. And with Ayurveda, you're going to educate me and tell me some ideas about what I should do. And then it's, it's my choice to say, you know, Charles was right about that dietary item or, you know, I, I know you're right, but I want to do it my way. The, you know, the Frank Sinatra quote, and, and then I can suffer as a, <laughs> as a result of that, which, you know, most doctors, uh, you know, in the, in the MD world have, you know, they began, I think in the eighties started saying, don't smoke, stop smoking to people. Right. People say, well, you can't tell me what to do. Uh, you know, then we had to develop motivational interviewing to teach people, teach doctors how to help people um, convince themselves to stop smoking. But then the hardest part is stopping smoking. And and and, and the other hard part, and, and there's so many hard things about our lifestyle today, which are hilarious to anyone who's not in a first world country. It's like, I have to sit all day. And somebody said, sitting is the new smoking. And I said, doggone it, I didn't smoke for a reason. And now I'm sitting all day as a result of my job. So whenever I have a phone meeting that's not on video now, I take my phone outside and here in Arizona, where I am um, most of the winter, I, I go outside and I walk around because I, I need those steps. I need the, and thank you, thank you, phone, for invading my life enough to tell me how many steps I've taken every day. I say, oh, okay, thanks, phone. I, I did 5,000, still 5,000 shy of the American Heart Association's 10,000 recommended steps but at least I'm not sitting. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I'm excited to to know about this and, and I'm glad that you've, uh, you know, told us so much knowledge so far about Ayurveda because I think people don't, people feel dependent on the quote medical model or the disease model of healthcare that they're helpless and they don't, you know, they, they can't and, and they just feel ill and they need to go get the Tums from the store after eating three donuts and having a, a, a hot coffee and, uh, you know, that, you, but, but empowering people to say, no, you, with a little education and a little, just a little bit of knowledge, you can, you can transform your whole body. And I mean, there's whole people that have podcasts on this, like uh, rich roll. I don't know if you heard of him. He's out of San Francisco or LA. And he was this guy, he was this lawyer and he was just eating cheeseburgers from McDonald's all the time, like every day after work. And he was overweight and he was angry and he was upset and he drank too much alcohol and then one day he said dang it i'm quitting my job <laughs> i'm going to become a uh, i'm going to become a vegan <laughs> which is hilarious and i'm going to 
I'm going to, I'm going to inspire people. And now he's like won all these awards for these ultra marathons and these iron mans and all in a vegan diet. And it's incredible. And now he's doing other things, but I remember hearing his story and I just thought, what in the, this is just incredible. You know, he, he went from this, this idea and his spiritual, I guess, or mental of, I am dependent on some doctor helping me until he realized I'm the one shoving four cheeseburgers in my mouth every day after work, after sitting all day and drinking alcohol and being angry at all these other court cases. And I hate, I hate being a lawyer. (laughs) He had to come to that conclusion. So, um, you know, the hard part is getting, uh, that's why I do podcasting. It's a free service because I feel like knowledge inspired me to move out of my situation when I was younger and knowledge is inspiring you to, you know, help people through Ayurveda. So um, I think the worldview of Ayurveda is something that is, is, you know, like you said, it's in the background right now and hopefully going to start. I would love to see Ayurvedic trending, so to speak, in the modern terms, in a good way, uh, where people actually read the actually read the books or watch the videos to learn about it so they can apply it because, um it's a do no harm model. You know, it's not like you're telling people of take out the scalpel and now see the cyst here. No, it's, <laughs> we're just, we're just talking about a balance, a balance of things. And, uh, I love that philosophy. Um, are you okay to answer another question or so? Sure. I know that, uh, this is your time is valuable and I know you've given a lot of energy to this so far. Um, I wanted to know, uh, you kind of covered the beginning, the beginning of Ayurveda, but I wondered about two things that I feel may be asked from this interview by people. This is just something I made up, but who knows? Yes. Two questions. The first question is a complimentary question. How can Ayurveda be complementary to Western mental health treatments, such as therapy or psychiatry or uh, things like that? How could Ayurveda help somebody, um, you know, be a complement to somebody's already in treatment? It's a good question, Paul. Uh, when I was in Brazil, first of all, my wife, who was Brazilian, she passed away a few years ago. She was a therapist and a very good one. Um, But we worked together in Ayurveda, and somehow or other, it seemed a good idea to try and see whether my assessment of one of her clients and the nature of their imbalance could be information useful to her as a therapist. And we found that this was true. If I could point her in a direction useful to a client of hers, say someone who suffered from chronic anger or indeed fear or depression. And if I could give her some pointers from the physical end of that spectrum, she found it very useful in her psychotherapy to um, to bring the physical into the the, the mental and emotional and uh, help people to help themselves. Now, uh, from time to time, I also use a form of um, astrological investigation, which give as to the timing of a person's health condition. Not always, but sometimes you can see in the transit of one planet or the other uh, an influence which is transitory, but which can somehow or other associate to a problem of health. After our initial experiments with how to combine Ayurveda with uh, mental health therapy, I began to work with other um, therapists and psychiatrists in the Rio area. At one point, I think there were four or five, half a dozen maybe, therapists who would call me up and give me a, a lowdown on a client or other, and I'd make some suggestions. And it was a very symbiotic relationship. Um, the therapist uh, obviously was much more effective dealing with the the mental and emotional health problems than I am. I have no specific training in that field, 
and I contributed the physical element. And it was a very uh, cooperative venture, uh, which I have continued to some uh, limited degree uh, here returning to the United States. Um, there's a therapist here on the island that I've been working with. And uh, she, some of her clients, when she brings uh, uh, the awareness of, of a physical element in their mental health picture, many of, of her, her patients seem to feel that, that doing that has been worth years of therapy. Mm. Um, it's very difficult for me, from my from the physical side, to imagine uh, a person completely well and balanced mentally and emotionally, if their physical uh, nature is out of whack, mind and body are connected. The mind can influence the body. The body can influence the mind. So, I would suggest that perhaps in future, the training of a therapist like yourself could include an element of Ayurvedic uh, philosophy and, and health system uh, so that you could, uh, w without uh, needing to refer to uh, another Ayurvedic practitioner, you could yourself see clearly and helpfully the connection between a physical imbalance and a mental or emotional problem. Yes, I actually just like the summary you gave. And I do think that um, I think it, it's difficult to have that awareness of the physical when you've had mental turmoil. I think mm. a lot of people withdraw when they have mental turmoil. Almost uh, most people I, I've never, I haven't heard. I mean, I'm sure people withdraw into the body, but I almost feel like people withdraw into some sort of mental dissociative state or a, a fantasy state or a denial state to not deal with what's happening. And then with, as a result of that, they may start ignoring their body. So if you're ignoring things that are going on in your mental state, I could see that you ignoring your body, but I definitely think it sounds like Ayurveda can definitely complement um, mental health care. And I do think um, it's important uh, for people to explore what's going on with the body. And, and as we know, the brain is located in the head, but it's not really located in the head because the nervous system goes throughout the body and the nervous system may not be, you know, the main processing center, if you will, um, but it is it is part of the processing center. And we know that sometimes uh, your body, and this is according to certain tests, will sense things before your mind does in nanoseconds, you know. Um, uh, that somebody's body would clench before their brain would be able to know what to do about a situation in a, in a fear situation. So, yeah. and, and not only that, but like, um, most of your serotonin receptors are found inside your stomach lining and other tissue there. They're not even found in the brain. So what does that tell us? Interesting. I didn't yes. know that. That's yeah. a Dr. Greenblatt. I want to say Dr. Greenblatt out of London. Uh, uh -huh. he's a psychiatrist. He actually published a paper on that about 10 years ago. Um, which is the medical model's version of starting to realize that what you put in your gut may affect your mental health, which Absolutely. I think Ayurveda knew about that 5,000 years ago. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Most of that, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but that, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with your answer on that. And I think that was good for the audience. I, I wanted to know uh, just a little bit about... Um, I guess the you mentioned something that I thought was interesting, and we could go there if you've got time, but you said something about time is a causal factor in health, according to Ayurveda. That, this is something that, I mean, time is an abstraction uh, in a way. You know, clock time does tick away, but for the most part, in fact, um, some people, even physicists, are beginning to suspect that that everything happens at the same time that everything is always now past present and future mm. uh, but things don't stay the same they change 
they change if only because time moves on. And so some illnesses arise just because of the timing of it, and they disappear when the time for that is over. Um, so timing, timing is important, even though it is abstract. Um, there is, I'm going to say something. I, I, I think we need to, to go into a little bit deeper waters here, just to challenge some of your, some of our listeners. One of the diagnostic tools um, of a well-trained Ayurvedic practitioner is assessing the uh, pressure and quality of the pulse at the radial artery, at the wrist. And it is possible there with experience to have a sense of the relative strength or weakness of the major organs in the body. You know, the heart, lungs, large and small intestine, the kidneys, the bladder, and so on. This is pointing towards your observation about the mind and body connection and how Ayurveda can help with um, psychotherapy. There is a pulse at the radial artery of the pericardium. This is that membrane that surrounds and protects the heart. It doesn't do much else. It's just uh, like a plastic bag to keep the heart from rubbing against the chest wall. Now, this is so interesting. If before adolescence, the child has experienced something too strong to accommodate, usually this is an unpleasant or traumatic situation, but it can be an experience of excessive, well, anything, joy, even excitement. But if, if there's too much emotion that cannot be reconciled pretty much at the time, it makes a palpable impression on the pericardium. And this can be felt at the radial artery um, as a relative low energy of that pulse. Now, if another organ pulse also shows up to be low in energy, let's say, for example, the gallbladder. So in taking the radial artery, both, both wrists you come across the low pericardium energy and a low gallbladder energy, it's a virtual certainty that before adolescence, that person will have experienced and suppressed one of three emotions, jealousy, resentment, or hatred. To explain completely and clearly why this is true, is beyond me. It's just an empirical fact. And I've borne it out clinically in hundreds, probably thousands of cases. So if I see a client who has low pericardium energy and low gallbladder energy, and they're in therapy with, for example, a person like you, I can advise you, this of course with permission from the client, they have to, to agree to all this. I can advise you to look at possible childhood suppressed resentment, jealousy, or hatred. And you can often, with this information, put the patient into awareness of what it was in their childhood that keeps triggering them even as an adult. Take, for example, someone comes to you with a strong case of jealousy. Their boyfriend has eyes for another woman, some such thing. It's unlikely, if it's serious, if it's a serious case of jealousy, it's unlikely that that condition arose in that circumstance. It's much more probable that that, in this case, would be a female, um, experienced something in before adolescence, maybe the father gave preferential treatment to her brother, uh, the son, or maybe she had a sister who was more brilliant and got all the attention. Um, and the child was not able to resolve jealousy that arose around 
circumstances like that. That is as much a trigger for the jealousy in the adult woman over the boyfriend's um, at, um, attentions elsewhere. And unless that root of the problem of jealousy is addressed and released, it will probably continue to operate throughout the life. So this is how, if for example, you and I were to work together and I saw, and I took the pulses of, of your patient and indicated, and another scenario would be, suppose the kidney energy was low, pericardium and kidneys. I would encourage you to look at uh, childhood fears that were unresolved, kidneys being the organs of fear. The lungs are considered to be the organs of grief. And uh, not in all cases, of course, but in extreme cases of, of grief in an adult, it can often be the case that there was some childhood wound, some childhood trauma producing grief that didn't get resolved, that became suppressed, and was therefore throughout the rest of life something like a like an emotional bruise doesn't hurt until you touch it and then it becomes active so ayurveda even physically as well as psychologically and emotionally is always looking for the primary or first cause of any condition because if the first cause can be discovered and addressed there may be no need for further treatment so, you know, interestingly enough, this aligns uh, with the research on EMDR therapy, which was started in the 1990s, uh, eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy and trauma informed counseling that has emerged in the last 15 years, um, where the, the theory goes and the research has substantiated this. In fact, the World Health Organization has now recognized EMDR as their number one therapeutic treatment for trauma. Um, although we could expand that saying everyone has some sort of trauma, that's possibly why the mental health disorder, uh, was inspired to, uh, start manifesting, you know, uh, epigenetics, they call it, uh, something in the nature caused the genetic switch to possibly go in that direction, or maybe it's just completely psychological, um, is that they're finding that if you can address these root traumas or large traumas and work with the person through the techniques, to fully acknowledge it, reprocess it, be able to look at it from a different viewpoint because you're getting into a deeper part of the brain than just talk therapy. What happens is their distress levels, every time something reminds them of this or they think of it or dream of it, reduce dramatically to the point where they may have zero distress except for a slight psychological feeling of mm, that wasn't pleasant that was not good but it's in the past but the problem is that we're finding is that when people have a traumatic trigger or reaction like you said time is always happening it's as if that thing is happening now but let's let's just say for instance the the woman you were talking about with the with the jealousy she may be completely unaware of the idea that her childhood, uh, you know, father subtly doing this in her environment for years of her life influenced her. And so then she just thinks, oh, I'm just jealous. I'm just a jealous person. She starts labeling herself. I'm a jealous person, which then further reinforces the jealousy and also then um, is interfering with all her relationships going forward. And so if we can, if we can go back there and find that sometimes it's an actual incident, sometimes it's just an amalgamation of smaller incidents and patterns and, um, and, um, attachment patterns that occur. So it's interesting that Ayurveda is very much in line with the newest research of trauma therapy, but it seems to go further because I had no idea about these different organ systems, like lungs being related to grief. I, I did not know anything about that. And so it's interesting that not only are you looking at the root of why is somebody responding the way they're responding in the present, but you're also looking at what, what systems may also have been affected physically, um, and, and where is that? And, and, and let's just say we can't say causation. We could at least say correlation. Um, and, and so there's a correlation there. And um, I, I must say that is fascinating to me. And I, uh, you know, it's, I think I, I just wish it was being studied more. I mean, EMDR, when it first came out, people thought it was 
witchcraft, new age tricks, wacky, whatever. And now it's recognized as the most uh, effective tr- treatment for trauma. In fact, uh, some soldiers came home from one of the wars that we had recently, and they had uh, PTSD, according to their psychiatrist at the VA. And they went through this whole trial, 12 sessions of this therapy, 12 sessions, and they came out without meeting the criteria for PTSD, for post-traumatic stress disorder. However, yes, <laughs> it is good. However, they might still have had depression or some anxiety, which probably started with the PTSD, but they were they were symptom-free of the PTSD itself in terms of certain things causing them to react like the old the event, the old uh, cliche of the door slamming. They thought a gun went off and they went up to the table. But I have friends who are veterans who have not received EMDR. And right now, if I go to a restaurant with them, of course, COVID, we can't. But before COVID, they would always want to sit facing the door. Always. And, and I remember, you know, at first I thought it was some sort of just habit from the military. And I said, well, I want to sit facing the door. And they said, absolutely not. And they got dead serious with me. I said, well, what? And they said, well, if there's a threat, I can see him coming and you can't. And you're not, you, you're not trained like me. And I said, but we're just at a restaurant. They said, it doesn't matter. Threats can happen anywhere. I said, oh, okay. Well, you're right. But also, I guess my nervous system isn't on that level where I don't feel like a threat's going to happen anywhere because I wasn't in a war with people trying to kill me. Um, so that being said, uh, I, I think there's some very interesting overlaps. And, and, and you know, with trauma therapy, the whole point is to get to the root cause. The point is to get you out of therapy and empowered into your life. And with Ayurveda, it's the same thing. It's like, can we get you balanced so that you can then not have to deal with, you know, possible disease development or these signs or signals or symptoms that, that keep uh, bothering you without even, without even um, hopefully, of, you know, getting it to the critical level of, of needing a surgical or, or medical, uh, Western medical intervention. You know, Paul, something you just said uh, has given me what I think is a serious insight. I have believed that Ayurveda would eventually grow up to be recognized as a useful modality in its own right and take its place next to Chinese medicine and perhaps homeopathy, you know, other alternative complementary systems of healthcare. Not that it's not quite a bit different, but what you just said made me think that Ayurveda may never become uh, important as a standalone modality. Yeah. Yeah. So Ayurveda's role in time to come may very well be as a component, you know, as one, say, course in the studies of a psychotherapist or one component in medical school, even in specialties like gastroenterology or pulmonology or um, even dermatology, there, there's an Ayurvedic uh, piece in the puzzle of any health condition. And if Ayurveda were incorporated into all the different specialisms and modalities, it could be, it could serve its most useful function because Ayurveda is, requires so much um, responsibility uh, of individuals. Remember, it's the, it's the, the science of self-healing. Um, and it may not happen anytime soon that people go to an Ayurvedic practitioner for any particular condition. They're still, and likely always, more likely to, to go to the specialisms that concern them. So if those specialisms have a component of Ayurvedic understanding, then Ayurveda serves its its best function, which is to point the way to the source or cause of problems, um, and at least a component in how to go forward with healing those problems. I think that would be great. Uh, It reminds me um, about how client-centered psychology by Carl Rogers and Gestalt uh, psychotherapy, and I can't remember who came up with that right now. I'd failed the quiz. 
um, Freud's psychodynamic, even some of Jung's um, archetypal metaphorical symbology uh, work and solution focused and motivational interviewing have sort of all been uh, become part of the standard practice of uh, little bits of it, not, not complete parts, but parts of it have been harvested for what we see as best practice in psychotherapy, right? So I really think that, uh, like you said, uh, instead of opposing these other types of medicine, uh, you know, I do think there's an ego or money-driven problem in the world, as we know, which money is, the love of money is the root of all evil. You've heard things like that. But um, how do we get disciplines who have their ways of looking at things and, and they are valuable to incorporate a holistic or root cause uh, detective work to uh, their systems? And I do think Ayurveda could be not just complementary, but um, revolutionary in that it would bring a different one. Let's say you're a doctor of some type of medicine and you have your protocol for diagnosis, but then you also take into account, you know, some of these think principles from Ayurveda that could, that could possibly help people with prevention. I know that I remember, uh, hearing recently that, um, you know, well, doctors usually refer out for almost everything these days to a specialist or whatever, but, uh, According to what I've been reading in the news about Americans' diets, almost every American could use a dietitian. So uh, we almost are to the point where our primary care doctors do need to tell us about our diet and what we're doing with our life, but they don't even have time because they can't bill for it. They can only bill for finding a disease or running your labs or doing a checkup or something. So it's a bizarre, a bizarre system, uh, and, and it's almost a sacrifice if you're a doctor trying to have your, your practice to, to bring in these principles. So it, it needs to come. I think it, it, like anything of value, uh, it's not going away, but it's almost like the grassroots have to spring up and slowly move to the top. I wish, I wish that it would be a top down thing, but just like EMDR and trauma informed counseling, the science was saying all of this stuff, the, the, the anecdotal evidence was saying it, but it wasn't until a ground work of people groundswell of practitioners started using it and then more and more studies slowly worked its way up to the world health organization the cdc uh, you know um national alliance for the mentally ill um all over the world that people started saying oh my gosh this is fantastic and this is what we want to do in addition to our talk therapy and it doesn't get rid of talk therapy it just we know talk therapy according to mri scans usually affects one part of the brain and when you have a traumatized nervous system, that part of the brain is harder to access, more difficult to access. And that's according to science. So we know EMDR is hitting on deeper parts of the brain during the process. So why not come together? And so our, I would say Ayurveda, why not bring some of these things into the medical practice? I think it's going to take a lot of grassroots effort to move it up to become complementary. But if, like you said, Chinese medicine and uh, can you know? I know the VA in California has been using um, acupuncture as an alternative to opiates, and why not to see if it it, it helps with some people's pain? Maybe not a hundred percent, but it it does. So why not use it? Um, and if if uh, other forms of of medicine are starting to become integrated, why not use Ayurveda as part of the integration? So I think that uh, is a great idea to. I don't know, put out there in the world. You mentioned uh, the importance of diet and the fact that, uh, at least for now, uh, most Western physicians don't, don't give very much importance to diet. They dive right in on the symptoms and start to treat problems. But I think we need to reset our springs a little bit. You know, there's been a, an outward growth in all fields with uh, more expansion in an outward way. And we, we're losing the inner connection. We're losing the, the more fundamental aspects of life itself. I, I was thinking as you spoke about a, a man who, who came to me uh, in Brazil, very worried about his two-year-old daughter. He brought her with him. She had um, very bad behavior. She was angry and irritable and cross and acting out and 
even though she was very young, they had her in various therapies to try and figure out what was wrong with her. And he'd heard that Ayurveda was different and what did I think about all that? Well, not being a, a, like you, a trained psychotherapist, I, I wasn't able to look at her behavior um, as a disorder in itself. So I used Ayurvedic principles and asked the father what her diet was. He said, normal diet for a child. And he mentioned some, you know, baby food and, you know, pureed vegetables and whatever else that uh, the child was eating. And I thought, well, hmm, I guess that's not a problem. And then he said, oh, well, there's just this, this other not very important thing. And that is, I have a fondness for, when I come home from work, I, I like to take crackers, put a piece of cheese on the cracker, and then a lot of black pepper. And I, uh, you know, this just a thing I like to do. And my daughter, observing that this was my habit and behavior, and I guess kind of wanting to be like her dad or with her dad, uh, asked for some of that. And I, I gave her, you know, so every day when I come home from work, she and I eat crackers with pepper and, and uh, cheese. Well, that was a bingo. The child was eating too much pepper and her pitta, or that is to say the you know, biological heat, was so high that she was always enraged, always angry. I said, simple, just stop giving her pepper cheese crackers. Within, I don't know, three days, the child was normal and happy and no problem at all. So he had had her to all kinds of, of GI specialists and psychotherapists and doctors of every stripe. Um, and everyone was looking for the problem on the most outward manifestation and not wondering what could be the cause, what could be the, the root cause of this. And this, I think, is what Ayurveda can contribute to many uh, health systems is to encourage to look for the cause of the problem and not just right away jump to the solution. Remove the cause, you remove the effect. And I think that Ayurveda um, training as part of every health discipline, physical as well as mental, um, could advance um, health on many levels because of its profound simplicity, because it's so fundamental. As you said, this some new research suggests that, that the gut is the center of a lot of our emotional life, you know, the whole business of metabolism and so on. It's absolutely true. So let's pay more attention to what we eat. Remember in this, well, you would remember in the 60s, you're not that old, but, but uh, along with peace and love is, you know, you are what you eat kind of thing. Everybody was vegetarian and all that sort of thing. Uh, but it's, it's more than that. It's not a question of being vegan or, you know, carnivore or any of the rest of it. It's whether the foods that you eat are suitable for your constitutional type. Pitta types, I'm one, for example, you know, we can eat car doors and no bother. <laughs> We're blessed with a hot metabolism. But if we eat too much, I don't know, you know, or as a Mexican food lover, you'll know all of those heat generating foods. And of course, Indian food is also pretty darn hot. Um, if anger and hot emotions are a problem, look to the diet. If fear is the problem, look to the diet. Uh, and if depression is the problem, look to the diet first. Now, there are other things that Ayurveda contributes, um, but diet, nutrition are so essential to our psychophysical health that a component of Ayurveda really should be a part, I think, of every health discipline. And then Ayurveda can be absorbed into all these other systems and will simply be a component of what we already are doing and won't have to, to fight for market share. If Ayurveda could be absorbed and then, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a knowledge sharing situation 
Um, and that is for the better of everyone. I wanted to know a little bit um, about two things. Number one, uh, maybe let's talk about you first. You know, you're still doing Ayurveda, you know, I guess with clients, practitioner, consulting, whatever you want to call it. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that and how, uh, how people can get a hold of you? I will have a link to your website in the show notes, but can you tell us a little bit about that? And then I want to ask a little bit about the current state of the world, but I want to start with you first. Hmm. The current state of the world has a pretty big impact on me right now, as it probably does to you too, with COVID and, you know, all the consequences of that. Um, when a person comes to me, and I'm usually the case of last resort, you know, people don't have a problem and look in the phone book for the nearest Ayurvedic practitioner to go to. <laughs> they usually go everywhere else first. And finally, if they're lucky, somebody says, well, you know, there's this guy or whatever, or this woman that does Ayurveda, give them a try. So when they come, I do an interview much as would happen in a conventional medical interview if there was enough time to do that. It usually takes about an hour. And I want to know not just what the person um, complains of, but what their family problems of health were, um, what they do you know, for a living, what their sleep. And you know, in other words, uh, a complete workup as much as possible without, of course, um, more sophisticated diagnostics like imaging and all that. And at the, in an hour of asking the appropriate questions, it's possible to form a pretty clear uh, understanding of what in that person is out of balance. And once that's determined, you know, if the person is perceived to have a vata imbalance or a pitta imbalance or a kapha imbalance, then it's a matter of um, suggesting a diet which not only doesn't aggravate the condition, but which opposes it. For example, if I'm, uh, as a pitta person, if I've been drinking too much coffee and maybe you know too many martinis or too many chili rellenos or anything that I'm ingesting, or in, for that matter, hanging out too long in a sauna or working in the summer out of doors in the midday sun. And if I'm, uh, showing signs, physical or psychological, of too much um, pitta, too much heat, too much anger, and so on, then I want to go to the opposite. I want to eat watermelon, <laughs> which is like a medicine for, for too much heat. It's very cooling. Um, I want to avoid the coffee and instead have some mint tea or some other refrigerant beverage. Um, I want to do my out of doors work before 10 or 11 and after two so that I don't get overheated by the midday sun, um, shorter and cooler showers or baths, um, meditation, uh, is very cooling and calming. So it takes an hour or so to figure out what is out of balance from the person's experience. And then it's a pretty easy matter to suggest a diet and uh, a formula of herbs. For example, in the case of too much pitta, too much heat, there are a number of, of herbs which herbologists put into the category of refrigerants. These are, these are foods or, or a form of food, which when ingested have the effect of cooling the body. Some of these herbs um, famously are from India. Um, most of them are available in this country through one supplier or another. But there are also many American herbs and herbs from other uh, cultures that are cooling uh, in their nature. And so avoiding foods which produce heat and taking an herbal formula that actually cools the body can often quite quickly resolve um, inflammatory conditions or of irritation, criticism, anger, being judgmental um, and having hatred and jealousy and so on. In other words, when a person's too hot, 
they need to be cooled down. When a person has too much water in the system, which causes them to be depressed, lazy, overattached to physical things, usually, but not always overweight, and therefore at health risk, then foods which are which contribute to too much water should be removed and replaced by foods which have a drying effect. Here is where your beans can be used to advantage because beans are drying. So beans could be perfect for a person with too much water, but wrong for a person with too much air. And this, uh, Paul, is for some people a problem. Um, we tend to think that there are foods which are good for you and foods which are bad for you. Ayurveda takes, takes the view that, that very few foods are good for everyone and very few foods are bad for everyone. It depends on your constitutional type and any imbalance that you may have. So diet, as you said in the very beginning of the show, is is critical. Um, I think it was Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, who suggested that food should be your medicine and medicine should be your food. That's as true today as it was in his day and true a couple of thousand years before Hippocrates when these early sages in India discovered the eternal and universal principles of Ayurveda. Yeah, you know, a hot emotion, and I think we're all pretty agreed that, that hot emotions include obviously anger, irritability, um, hatred, and so on. These hot emotions have at their root an excess of internal heat. Usually this is the result of unsuitable diet for that person. But it can also have to do with lifestyle um, and other considerations. But in this case, in this model, um, if a person has hot emotions, they can cool those emotions down by eating cooling food or drinking cooling drinks and avoiding foods which, you see, food itself is Ayurvedic. You know, a carrot is a living thing. It has its own vata, pitta, and kapha. Every living thing is shot through with these three biological forces. So if a food is high in, in, uh, in uh, pitta, if it's like a cayenne pepper, then if you're a vata person, or indeed even a kapha person, both of whom suffer from too much cold, Sure, use a little cayenne pepper, warm you up, and oppose the problems of depression or fear. But if you're a pitta person or have a pitta imbalance and you're already too hot, better leave the cayenne pepper alone. It's like gasoline on the fire. I wanted to ask you about, as we kind of close uh, the conversation for today, uh, in our culture right now around the world, we have the quarantine of COVID-19, all of the deaths daily. I mean, in the U.S. right now, we're up to 3,000 plus people dying a day from complications uh, due to COVID or COVID um, amplifying a condition they already had and taking them over the edge. And in the United States right now uh, and around the world, but right now, we're, this is where we are, a lot of social upheaval here with the transition um, to the new president and uh, a lot of uh, disruption and uh, riots at the Capitol. So could you, could you tell us a little bit about Ayurvedic philosophy? We've talked a, a lot about all the elements of it, but just how per perhaps people could get into Ayurvedic philosophy and how this might help them with their minds and their nervous systems right now as they're experiencing the fallout from these uh, things, both locally and nationally. The goal of Ayurveda is to produce integration of the four components of our lives, the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. Each of these four have to be respected and 
in balance in order for a person to function in what ought to be considered normal human behavior. Ayurveda is a spiritual discipline in the sense that everything, everything is spiritual. When we forget that, we've lost, well, we've killed the goose that lays the golden egg. We need always to be interdirected, centered in, our, in ourselves before we can consider acting usefully in the world outside. We've seen too much lately of national or public figures who themselves clearly lack internal balance, whose lack of balance affects all the rest of us on the national level. Um, it's almost the responsibility of our leaders to be as balanced, as well integrated physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, because they are our leaders. If they don't have their um, systems operating uh, in a balanced way, their, I want to say disequilibrium, I think that may be a Portuguese, uh, their imbalance can wreak havoc on all the rest of us. The, the rioters at the Capitol, there were some few thousand. Every one of us has, had, uh, has received some impact from watching that rage in our, in our nation's capital. Um, we must understand they are our brothers and we must understand that, that that unacceptable, most people would say unacceptable behavior is the result of imbalances in those people. If they were better integrated, happier, calmer, more centered in themselves, we doubt that they'd be um, acting out as they have done and putting our nation at risk and making us, uh, we are mocked now in the rest of the world. So from the top down or perhaps from the bottom up, we really need individually to take responsibility for our health. My ill health affects those people in my environment. And I don't think I have the right that my imbalance should affect the lives of other people. So um, I think it's, it's a question of each person accepting responsibility for their own health. That's what attracted me to Ayurveda in the first place was having that book jump off the shelf into my hands titled Ayurveda, the science of self-healing. Ultimately, all healing is self-healing. And each of us is responsible for our own health, at least insofar as ill health can negatively impact other people. It's a moral responsibility for us individually to ensure our Absolutely. health. Absolutely. And I think speaking both the top down and the bottom up, I would say, first of all, to everyone listening who feels helpless, you can start working on yourself today. You can learn from a book. Absolutely. You can meet with a mentor. Um, if you have health care, um, you can see a practitioner. Um, there are ways to get self-improvement. The internet is both a blessing and a curse. You have to watch your resources. You have to critically think who wrote this, when was this written. But, um, local libraries, however, if you can get to a local library, uh, they now have internet resources. So you can look at databases of articles, you can check out books. And if you have trouble reading now through your phone or through the computer, you can now through the local library for free access almost every audiobook in existence. Um, yes, that's a new thing. Uh, it's called Hoopla. You can ask about it at your local uh, library if you just have a library card. So people that have trouble reading and concentrating, uh, you can you can do that as well. It's called Hoop Hoopla, like hoop and then L.A. 
So another thing here I want to say is top down. Um, I like that you talked about they are our brothers and sisters that did this. Um, And I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's such a controversial subject. It's so easy to want to hate them just like they hate whatever they were hating. Who knows? Uh, But Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think on the positive side, you know, we try to do that in our lives as practitioners, but on the negative side, (laughs) we'll go here for a second. I think that a a lot of these people that rioted, um, in fact, I'm convinced of it, a lot of the people that rioted and a lot of the people that caused destruction of property and worse, um, the deaths of some police officers, uh, were, they felt a certain way because of what they were being told repetitively. And that comes from the top. And But it also comes from, I'm going to hang men out to dry here, mostly men on the radio and writing things on the internet that were inflammatory because they knew that these people feeling helpless in their own lives or having difficulties in their own lives with certain things um, would take the bait, get angry enough and do something that they themselves are afraid to do. They won't take the action. The radio hosts weren't there with guns. It was their listeners that were there with guns. Donald Trump said, well, I went there, I went there. He said he would, he said he would <laughs> march with them to the Capitol in his speech, and he did not. He left them out hanging dry. And 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 the voices, you know, the voices on the radio and the internet that are are so angry all the time. Uh, they always seem to want responsibility for other people. They say, oh, these poor people and these people are wrecking our country and they're ruining this and ruining that. And I would say to them, think about what you're saying. You're not focusing on the positive aspects of these people. You're not focusing on the positive things about our country. And you're certainly not taking responsibility for what you're saying. And unfortunately, a lot of people are upset in their lives. And when you're upset, it's a lot easier to find a common enemy or a scapegoat than it is to deal with your own darkness. Because any one of us in our most angry moment could think, you know, I, I, maybe I will break a window, I'm so angry. But not many of us, uh, uh, well, many of us, in fact, did fall victim to not only getting angry in the moment, but the entire situation was a planned out plot for three to five weeks to cause havoc, to disrupt the democracy. And it was well thought out, which means that these people are operating in this angry field and this angry way of living based on, uh, you know, I don't want to get into too much politics here, but according to the Supreme Court and 60 other judge decisions appointed by bipartisan people, um, untruths. Um, And and thus, um, you know, freedom of speech does cover, you're allowed to say whatever you want, but you're not allowed to incite violence. You're not allowed to, you know, there's six things I think that aren't allowed under the First Amendment. And one of them is inciting violence or inciting uh, crimes. Um, that is not considered uh, free speech. And that's a whole other topic for another day and another podcast. But I think it's important to see in the Ayurvedic world, these people were out of balance. They were, they were stoked up. They were heated by many words and many images and uh, many beliefs and took violent action. And unfortunately... Um, people died. And secondly, uh, uh, people were terrorized. Thirdly, destruction of property. And fourth, now um, the this actually caused our justice system to kind of wake up from a sleeping at the wheel and not thinking that these that a protest would be a threat. And a protest isn't a threat. If they would have just protested and yelled and screamed, it would have been fine. It would have been on the news. That's it. They, and, but not invading, um, you know, a place of democracy. So, um, violently. So now all of these people are going to be arrested or most of them because there's, they all took pictures of themselves doing it because they thought they were, this was the right thing to do. And they all posted on some, all the social medias about where they were and what they did. And that was all captured by, um, people that preserve, it's called archivism. They've archived everything on parlor, everything on Facebook. They've archived all this. These people are going to be arrested and go to jail. And, you know, they did it. So, okay, that's our justice system. But it's unfortunate that (laughs) all the people that encourage them to do this sort of thing uh, may not be held accountable for it. And and I think that's the tough part about living in a society that's so large and so big as the United States is that we all have different viewpoints and we have different perspectives on things that should be done. 
Uh, but the hard part is how do we focus on what are the common factors that we agree on? If we have a Venn diagram and we have all these different political and religious and social beliefs, what are the things in the middle that we have in common? Can we focus more on that? And then maybe these outlying things aren't such a big deal after all. Um, but I was going to say that I don't know if that would sell airtime on the radio, but go ahead. <laughs> well, here's something that, that, uh, that, that can be food for thought for thoughtful people. Um, there's a sutra means a sutra means an aphorism, you know, a, a saying, um, a little gem of wisdom, some would say, that declares that fear is the mother of anger. Now we take these rioters just as one example, those people who went into the to the Capitol building, and we saw them on television. And for sure they looked angry. But what if fear is what gave birth to that anger? You know, when you think about it, you're driving your car on the highway and somebody comes quickly up alongside and cuts too too closely in front of you. And your first reaction seems to be, you know, come back here and I'll, you know, I'll show you what I think of that <laughs> maneuver. But think about it. In the instant before you had that angry reaction, you were frightened. You were put at, you were put at risk. What if those people who invaded the Capitol weren't angry as they seemed to be, but were acting out of fear? You know, we call that domestic terrorism, and it was. And we're now we're we're uh, our we're worried about both um, uh, international terrorism and domestic. And terror is an extreme form of fear. Now, the terrorists put fear in us because they blow stuff up and kill us. But maybe they're terrorized themselves. Maybe that's why they do it. Maybe they feel dispossessed or dishonored or undervalued, worthless. And this fear uh, translates into anger so that they can feel more powerful. So then the problem is not anger as it seems to be. You know, years ago, this is just an anecdote. You can cut this out, but no, okay. Years ago, I found that I was brilliant at enumerating all of the ills of society. You want to know what's wrong? Come to me. I can rant for a good hour on the nuclear threat and the environmental threat and how, you know, people are going to hell in a handcart, all the rest of that. And one day I caught myself doing that and realized not only am I not helping the problem, but mm. I'm adding to it. So I challenged myself to figure out a solution to the world's problems. Kind of a high bar, must have had a <laughs> slow day. My first thought was, we've got to fix the problem of anger because terrorism and all, you know, the the, you know, everybody, the Catholics and the Protestants, the Israelis and the Arabs. I mean, it's, it's just everybody's at war. So we've got to fix anger. But then I remembered the sutra that I just shared with you, that fear is the mother of anger and realized, no, it's not anger that we need to address. It's fear. How can I use Ayurveda to address the problem of fear? Paul, what came is a product, or I might almost call it an invention, called peace oil. This is a, a formula that I make with a number of calmative herbs that I cook into an almond oil base. And what be this is that drop in each nostril produces nothing strong. It's not like Thorazine. You don't go into a coma from it obviously it's a non-medicinal but it's mildly calmative it kind of resets the spring and people who use it report that their meditations seem clearer their memories are better even sleep is better and they feel less ungrounded and i had um i was going to say the illusion but probably delusion is a better word that i could somehow find a benefactor to 
make this in in huge quantities and make it available all around the world so that everybody could put peace oil in their nose and we would not be so frightened and therefore not so angry and therefore not hurt each other. But that's a business situation and I'm certainly not a business person. And so after wasting quite a bit of money trying to find a way to market this thing, I, I had to give up. But you know, now in light of COVID, as much as anything, and perhaps not less the political chaos that we're facing, I think it's time for peace oil to make a reemergence now. So I'm going to see what I can do. I have a friend who's brilliant at internet stuff, and she's made for me a website with you know, products and services. And I'm going to see if we can't find a way to get peace oil out there. It's inexpensive, it's effective, and well, it's better than grumbling about the problem. I like it. And so I think that fits in perfectly as kind of a wrap to um, Ayurveda and so much more and how it can integrate in your life. And um, the best thing about this interview is that you can actually contact Charles Goodman, thanks to the internet, and actually even do a consultation over uh, the video uh, right from where you are right now and um, see some of your writings on the website and the magazine uh, that you helped begin, Ayurvedic Today, I believe is what it's called. Yes, uh, it, it's still out there. Um, and uh, I think this is a very good resource. I, I believe that people are going to really enjoy uh, this, this talk with you and um, I'm excited to put it out there in the world. And I, I'm so gracious that we were able to cover so much territory today um, it's been wonderful. Well, I've enjoyed it too. It's always, well, of course, it's my bliss, as it were, my passion. But it's so simple and natural and and universal that it's not a question of being a belief system or or indeed an alternative to anything. This is this is how it is. This is this is biological truth, and if we learn to live with and in accordance with the laws of nature and not to continually oppose them, we can have the peaceful world that I and other beauty pageant <laughs> winners and sisters, their biggest oh, desire, right. world, world peace. peace. And you know, it would be great. Um, it's complicated, but I think we have to start somewhere. So if we start with peace oil, or if we start with meditation, or if we start with Ayurveda, or if you go to therapy, if you do anything for yourself, uh, you're going to start seeing results in your relationships. And, and and you're going to see people attracted to you. And I don't mean that in a romantic sense, as, but it might, maybe if you're into that, if that's where you're at in life. But it, it, we, people will be attracted to the fact that you made a change within yourself. And I think, I think was it Gandhi that said, uh, be the change you want to see in the world? Be the change? Um, and, and that's been inspiring to me because I could also wax poetic for hours about all the problems and this and that and these these people and that and this and that and I and I said, uh, well, well, why not start coming up with some solutions? And this podcast is one of my free solutions to inspire other people to make materials or to do something that I don't have the skills to do. And I'm still working on my National Violence Prevention Hotline, which we'll talk about. I'm going to start uh, finally this year. Looks like I'm going to be able to have money to get the grant written and um, talk to some legislatures. Um, we'll see if it'll go anywhere. Um, it's, uh, but, uh, I'm glad that you're contributing your bliss and, and, uh, I think this has been, uh, bliss making this with you. So, uh, until next time. And there you have it. Until next time on The Intentional Clinician, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week. If you would like to contact Charles Goodman, I'm going to have his website in the show notes. He still does consultations. And thanks to the internet, he can now consult with you all around the world. 
If you are searching for an Emdria consultant, I am now an Emdria consultant in training and can provide 15 of the 20 hours needed to become an Emdria certified therapist. I'm going to be starting my Emdria consultation groups, and in fact, one has already begun. Please check out the details at counselingsupervisorgr.com or healthforlifegr.com. Those links will be in the show notes. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids area at Health for Life Grand Rapids and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. Thanks to telehealth, any one of our therapists can see you if you are in the state of Michigan. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon their literature and their experience in their respective fields, these should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on this or any other subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. Are you a young person of color feeling down, stressed, or overwhelmed? Text Steve, that's S-T-E-V-E, to 741741, and a live, trained crisis counselor will respond. Again, I very much enjoyed my interview with Charles Goodman. He is such an amazing, authentic person, and he just said what he knows and he has had experience he told me a lot of stories about his experiences learning all over the world including in england canada brazil and the northwest united states and he is a person that just really loves people and wants to help and i think we need more voices like his in the world and we need to amplify his voice so i'm so glad that he agreed to be my guest on this show and I really urge people to share this show with people that are interested in learning about the principles of Ayurveda or just are interested in philosophy and health in general. As Charles discussed, one of uh, our many quests and journeys in life is to learn how to self-heal and that is something that takes a lot of work and often, uh, I, obviously we don't recommend doing that in the beginning almost all of us need a guide, a teacher, a healer of some type. And so that being said, if you are not in a position to have a mentor or a healer or some type of guide in your life, either wherever you live or different circumstances, start with knowledge. Knowledge is power, as they say. And learn things that you don't know. Read things. And make sure you're coming from a source that you believe has their heart and mind in the right place. All right. Thanks so much for listening. Take care, everybody. I'm
I, I think your questions and what you contributed from your own experience, I think it was a very nice, balanced conversation between two people who obviously care about what they do and the state of the world and helping people. And it's got to be uplifting, regardless of whether anybody does anything. You know, we, we have goodwill. <laughs>